Hi, I'm Casey Petrie, and today we're going to talk about the Emergency Department of Pericardiac Synthesis. Uh, the indications for an emergent pericardial synthesis are a known or suspected pericardial effusion or tamponade, leading to a hemodynamic compromise, collapse, or cardiac arrest. While there are no absolute contraindications for an emergency department of pericardial synthesis, uh, trauma is a relative contraindication because it's often thought to delay the time for the ultimate procedure of an emergency department or a colony. To prepare for your pericardial synthesis, you're going to need to set a few things up. The first thing is to arrange consultation emergently with either a cardiac surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, or a cardiologist. Next, you want to place your patient in a pseudo-recumbent position between 30 and 45 degrees. This will allow the best access to the chest while bringing the heart closest to the chest wall or the subcostal area. To identify the pericardial effusion, you're going to want to use an ultrasound machine. There are three points of interest that we're going to look at when we identify our pericardial effusion. First and easiest is the subzygote view. Subzygote view can be found by palpating the xiphoid bone, putting your probe directly underneath it and aiming towards the top right shoulder. The next view that we want to look at is the left parasternal view. So between the fifth and sixth intercostal uh, spaces, between uh, zero and one centimeters left of the, the sternum, uh, you want to go directly perpendicular to the skin to see if you can find evidence of an infusion or cardiac activity there. The third window that we want to look at is the apical view. This is classically between the fifth, sixth, and seventh intercostal spaces and about five centimeters lateral to the sternum. This view will give you your classic apical four chamber view. The equipment that you're going to need to do a pericardial synthesis in our emergency department is located in the hallway behind A6. We have a pericardial synthesis drawer, which features a commercial pericardial synthesis kit that looks like this. We'll lay it out for you a little bit later. You're also going to want chlorhexidine and a standard chest tube tray. Alternatives, if you're working in a center where you don't have access to a commercial pericardial synthesis set, or if you can't find this, uh, would be a 7 to 9 centimeter 18 gauge spinal needle. This is what you'll need. Sterile gloves and a surgical mask. Sterile gloves and chlorhexidine. 1% lidocaine without epinephrine, a epoxy C syringe, a blunt film needle, and a long 25 gauge sharp needle. A commercial pericardiosynthesis set. A commercial chest tube insertion set. In our commercial pericardiosynthesis kit, this is what's available. A short and a long 18 gauge steel needle, a dilator, a pigtail catheter, a guide wire, and a connecting piece. This is an open chest tube kit. This has sterile drapes, a scalpel, which will be needed to make the skin cut, sutures to suture the drain in place should you choose to leave it there, clamps to clamp the drain, as well as an ability to set up a sterile prep film. There are three approaches to using an ultrasound to guide your pericardial synthesis. The first is a static approach, where you landmark with the ultrasound, put it down, and then use the trajectory that you've already determined to establish your needle or course. The second is a dynamic approach. Similar to a central line, you use the ultrasound to watch the needle penetrate the pericardial effusion. The third is a remote approach. During the remote approach, 
You simply use the ultrasound to observe the pericardial effusion shrinking while you drain it. This patient is periarrest. I can see that he has a large pericardial effusion, and I've made the decision to do an emergency department pericardiosynthesis. Chlorhexidine should be used to prep all three sites in case you need to change your angle of approach. Anesthetize the skin and the anticipated tract of your needle all the way down to the pericardium. The patient is prepped and anesthetized. Based on what we've seen on the ultrasound, I've decided to do a static approach from the sub zyphoid area. Initiate the procedure by palpating the xyphocostal angle on the left side. Insert the needle approximately one centimeter deep, and then change your angle to about 30 degrees, pointing the needle up towards the left mid scapula. I'm going to insert my needle with constant negative traction. When I feel the pericardium pop and see a gush of fluid, I'll know that I've entered the pericardial space. This may also be acutely painful for the patient. At this point in a cardiac arrest situation, you'd like to have a large 60 cc syringe to aspirate as much as 300 cc's of fluid. If the patient is not in arrest, what I would do would be thread my guide wire through the needle and into the pericardial space. You may or may not be able to confirm your wire's location by ultrasound. You should have an approximate depth based on your previous ultrasound findings. Similar to a central line, make a nick in the skin, move the dilator, and insert your pigtail catheter. The catheter will curve when it's inside the pericardium. You want to make sure that at least all of the holes in the catheter have reached the pericardial space. Connect your catheter to a sterile collecting system. Draining 300 cc's should be enough to hemodynamically stabilize any unstable tamponade. You don't want to drain more than 500 cc's at once. After you've drained 300 cc's, continue with your resuscitation. Where the hell is cardiology? This patient's disposition will be to the cardiology CSU, cardiac surgery, or thoracic surgery in a moderate setting. Complications are surprisingly uncommon. The most serious complications are laceration of the myocardium, laceration of a coronary artery, vascular injury of the subcostal or mammary vessels resulting in hemorrhage, or an arrhythmia. Other serious complications include an air embolism, a pneumothorax, or a solid or hollow organ perforation. Other complications include a vasovagal episode, which actually present actually presents in 25% of these patients. You'll want to be aware of pericardial decompression syndrome, which is a paradoxical congestive heart failure that results when you've drained more than 500 cc's at once from a pericardial infusion. 